So just as we had axial bones and appendicular bones, we're, all, we're going to have axial musculature and appendicular musculature. So this lecture will focus really on just the axial musculature, which is going to be, you know, uh, face, neck, um, chest, and spine, back. And then we'll have a separate lecture for uh, shoulder, arms, uh, pelvic, girdle, and legs. So here are the four groups of axial muscles, which really I just mentioned, uh, head and neck. Um, these are important really, especially in the head for facial expression, um, for eye movement so that you can kind of interact with your world through your eyes, tongue and speech, so communication, chewing and swallowing, eating. Vertebral column is uh, gonna have flexors and extensors, things that help you bend your back, back forward, things that help you bend your back backwards. Um, and we're not going to spend a lot of time there. Abdominal and pelvic cavities uh, are important for breathing. Uh, they're going to rotate the spinal column and support the abdominal cavity. Uh, when we get to uh, physiology, we'll talk a bit more about uh, the breathing muscles. Uh, but here we'll kind of learn their names and just um, learn some uh, brief facts about them. Then we have the perineal uh, or pelvic uh, cavity that's basically held, that that cavity is enclosed with um, a floor of muscles, and we'll go through uh, several of those as well. So let's start with the neck. Um, I'm going to show you these pictures fairly regularly during the muscle chapters. Um, when I was in medical school, we had to learn all of these origin and insertion sites, um, and I I think it is helpful to do that as far as um, learning the function of the muscles or the movements which the muscles create when they contract. So if you knew the insertion point and the origin of every muscle, you'd be able to figure out what kind of motion it causes. Um, so I would encourage you to pay attention to the origins and insertions, um, but I'm not going to give you a picture like this with arrows and ask you, you know, which muscle originates here, which muscle inserts here. So I think this is useful information, um, but I won't really require this of you on the exams. So let's start as we have uh, often started with a case. This will be the case of Sarah. She's 21 years old, and she woke up this morning with weakness on the left side of her face. Um, one of her roommates told her that she might be having a stroke, so she came to the emergency room. Uh, when you look at her, you see that she tries to smile, and the right side of her face smiles just fine, but the left side is unable to smile. Um, she's also unable to close the eye on the left side. Um, she can open it, she just can't close it. She has no really other symptoms like headache, dizziness, vision change, trouble swallowing, no weakness in her arms and legs, um, and her vital signs, including her blood pressure, are normal. So we're gonna come back to this and ask the question, um, what, what's going on here? What is wrong? Is, it, is there a problem with her muscles or her nerves or her brain? Uh, what is causing this left-sided facial weakness? Okay, so let's begin by looking at um, the muscles that surround the mouth. Most of these muscles in the face, in fact, are gonna be innervated by the facial nerve, uh, cranial nerve seven. So you'll see when we get to um, the, the nervous system or the brain um, unit, we'll see that cranial nerve seven gives sensation to pretty much all of the face. And similarly, facial nerve, the facial nerve, which is cranial nerve number seven, innervates nearly all of the muscles of the face as we go through, I will point out the muscles that are the exception uh, to the facial nerve. There are some on the face that are innervated by other cranial nerves, and I'll point those out as we go along. But in general, you can remember that most of these muscles are controlled by the facial nerve. Okay, so let's start with the buccinator. The buccinator is a deep muscle, so if you're looking here on the picture that you have in front of you, uh, and this is going to be helpful as you go through learning muscles uh, for the next couple of weeks to ask yourself which muscles are superficial and which muscles are deep. So the buccinator 
is a deep muscle. That means it's buried under muscles that are closer to the surface. So um, you can't see all of that muscle until you remove the muscle that's on top of it. So for example, the buccinator is largely hidden by the masseter muscle, which we'll talk about here in a minute. So um, it'll be helpful, I think, if you put buccinator in that kind of deep muscle category. So what's the purpose of the buccinator? You have one on both of your cheeks, um, not on the inside, but really on the outside under the skin uh, on your cheeks. And when they contract, they kind of pull the cheeks inward, uh, which kind of makes the lips pucker a little bit. So this is what happens, for example, when a baby is breastfeeding or bottle feeding even. Um, when they, when they uh, suck on the bottle or the breast, this is the muscle that's largely being used as the buccinator on either side. So very important uh, early in life, but um, also later in life uh, to help us to continue to suck on things like a straw or a lot of you carry around a water bottle that needs to be um, sucked in order for the water to come out. The buccinator is also helpful for moving food around the mouth uh, along with the tongue. Then we have um, a couple of muscles that are going to help to um, either elevate or um, depress the, the lip. And so you're going to see that these muscles both have the word labii. Um, and the term inferioris or superioris tells you which lip we're talking about. So if we have a depressor labii inferioris, that's telling you, labii tells you it's lip, inferioris tells you lower lip, and depressor tells you that it depresses, it pulls downward uh, on the lower lip when it contracts. So we would say it depresses the lower lip, but it also everts it. Uh, think about making a pouty face with your lower lip, where you don't just pull your lip down, but you'll actually turn it inside out a little bit. You evert the bottom lip. And so the depressor labii inferioris, um, which is this muscle in here, on both sides, uh, that's the one that's going to help you do that. Okay, well, just like you have a depressor to pull down on the bottom lip, you're going to have a levator, or you can think of something that elevates, right? You can almost see the word elevate in the word levator uh, for the upper lip. And we know it's the upper lip because it says labii superioris. So that's telling you it's the upper lip, and it's the muscle that elevates the upper lip. So it's going to, just like the uh, depressor labii inferioris, depressed and everted the lower lip, this one is going to elevate and evert the upper lip. Uh, so that's the labii, the levator labii superioris. You can see runs in here. And it's a little bit deeper too. You can see that there's some other muscles kind of running over the top of it. So it's one of those muscles that's just a layer deeper in the face. Okay, we continue looking at muscles around uh, the, the mouth, still innervated all of them by cranial nerve number seven. Uh, and we can kind of move up. Uh, well, let's, let's stick here to orbicularis since we're kind of talking about the ones around the mouth. Orbicularis oris, um, oris just means mouth. And orbicularis tells you that it's, it's circular in shape, if you remember from those generic uh, terms that we learned earlier. So this is going to be a muscle around the mouth that's circular. This should be one, this is one of those kind of landmark muscles that you should be able to easily identify on a model, on a picture, um, and be able to say, okay, I know what that muscle is. Now let's look at what muscles are near that muscles or which muscles uh, seem to come out from that muscle. So let this be one of your reference muscles. It's very easy to find because it's the muscle that surrounds the mouth and when it contracts and kind of shrinks down you can imagine that that would kind of purse the lips so for example sometimes that's called the kissing muscle because it's the muscle that you use to pucker up your lips okay if we kind of go up from orbicularis oris or out from or, uh, orbicularis oris we will find um, a zygomaticus 
uh, mus muscle. So there's a zygomaticus minor and a zygomaticus major, which we'll talk about on the next slide. But zygomaticus minor, remember uh, the zygoma, if you remember from the, um, from the axial skeleton, the zygomatic arch, if you remember that, and the, the zygomatic bones, that was the cheekbones, right? So zygomaticus minor is already telling you this is going to be a muscle that overlies the cheek. And if there's a zygomatis minor, there must be a zygomatis major, which we'll see in the next slide. So zygomaticus minor is going to elevate the upper lip. And we can see it here as that, that one. And you've got one on both sides. So if you, if you only pulled up one of those, you would just kind of elevate one side of your lip. If you do both of them, then you would elevate the entire lip. So it would work along with um, the levator labii superioris to elevate the upper lip. Okay, mentalis, if you remember, um, mentis um, was the, the part of the body that we call the chin. So the mentalis muscle is going to be a muscle that overlies the chin. And so that's gonna be fairly easy to identify because it's gonna be the muscle right on the tip of the chin. And it's also a bit of a deeper muscle uh, when it contracts, um, it either uh, everts and protrudes that lower lip and can even kind of elevate it a little bit. If you were trying to do, for example, like make an underbite and that lower lip would come up, mentalis is one of the muscles that's involved there. Okay, so continuing our talk, I'm going to just skip down to zygomaticus major just because we, we just mentioned zygomaticus minor. So zygomaticus, again, tells you it's over um, the cheek. So there are two of these oblique muscles that are kind of superficial and overlie the cheek area. Zygomaticus minor, which we just mentioned in the previous slide, and zygomaticus major. And how are you going to tell them apart? Well, major and minor tell you something about the size of the muscle. So major should be a bigger muscle than minor. So that would be one way that you could tell. Uh, you might also just... Uh, remember that major is more lateral and minor is more medial, if that's helpful. Uh, but zygomaticus major, because it's a little bit more lateral and because it attaches at the corner of the lip as opposed to the top of the lip where zygomaticus minor attaches, zygomaticus major not only pulls the lip up, but it also pulls the lip out. And so you get elevation of the lip up and then it pulls it out. And I just kind of think of Elvis. If you've ever seen Elvis do his routine, and he kind of says, you know, thank you, thank you very much, and he's got his, you know, he's got his lip kind of curled outward. His upper lip is kind of curled up and out. That's zygomaticus major that's really uh, making that, um, that kind of Elvis type of lip. Okay, um, let's go back to the top here and look at Resorius. So Resorius is another one of those really easy to identify muscles um, because it is um, superficial and it is pretty much completely transverse. It's like the only horizontal muscle um, in on the face. And so you can see it here. I've kind of colored over it a little bit, but it's this muscle here. Um, you can probably see it on your uh, PowerPoint that you have because I haven't put the color over it already. But um, that rosorius muscle is gonna attach at the corner of the mouth. So on this side, it's been removed so that you can see the masseter muscle better, but it basically runs in this direction, pretty much uh, perpendicular to the long axis of the face. So it's a, it's a transverse muscle, um, and it's really easy to identify because it's right on the surface. And that's going to move the corner of the mouth laterally because it attaches to the corner of the mouth. And because of the direction that it moves, when it contracts, it's going to pull that lip out without pulling it up or pulling it down. Okay, so just like uh, we had um, the depressor labii inferioris, we have a depressor anguli oris. So if you would just kind of pull that apart, depressor would tell you it's going to move it downward, right? Anguli means it's going to turn it down at an angle, and it also tells you that it inserts at the corner of the mouth, if you think of angle and corner, and oris just means mouth. 
So this would be the the muscle if you, you know, somebody told you um, something that was, you know, bad or was uh, kind of scary or, and you might go, you might say, yikes, just say yikes with me and watch, watch the corner of your mouth go down and out when you say yikes. Um, so that kind of downward and outward or lateral movement is caused by depressor anguli oris. And you can see it's right there and it's right there on the other side. Okay, now make sure that you can find some of these major muscles here on this uh, picture as well because I will use this very picture. Um, I don't have enough face models to, um, to give you a model for all of the facial muscles on your exam, so I'm going to have to use some of these cadaver pictures, and this one comes from your book. Um, there are some samples as well in the, um, in the anatomy lab if you want to take a look at them next time you're there. Uh, but make sure that you can identify some of these muscles that we've been talking about um, on this kind of a picture as well. So for example, you know, these arrows here are pointing to uh, orbicularis or orbicularis oris, for example. Um, here's zygomaticus major. This is zygomaticus minor. Uh, just for example, this is the masseter muscle, which we haven't talked about yet. This is platysma, which we haven't talked about yet. But so there's there's a bunch of muscles that you can see here. Make sure you study this picture um, on not only here but on the PowerPoint. You'll have a, a sample of this as well. And, and maybe even quiz yourself when you come to lab um, and see if you can find some of the major muscles on this type of picture. All right, so we're going to kind of continue talking about um, muscles of the face, but we're going to move up towards the eye and the forehead. And a lot of these are still innervated by cranial nerve 7, but we're going to start to see a little bit of um, variation here on a couple of the muscles. So if we just look at um, corrugator supercilii, um, which you can see is this one, this little muscle here. You see how it kind of comes at an angle and just above the eye and kind of attaches to the bridge of the nose. So that's gonna help you wrinkle your brow. So if you're very thoughtful, uh, you know, you're just kind of wrinkling your forehead as you try to memorize something um, that's corrugator supercilii that's being used there. Um, and then let's skip down to orbicularis oculi. So remember there was an orbicularis oris that was the circular muscle, muscle around the mouth. There's also an orbiculari, sorry, an orbicularis oculi, which is going to be a circular muscle around the eye. This is going to be another one that should be very easy for you to identify. It's this circular muscle that goes around the eye, orbicularis oculi. And so you can imagine when that contracts, it kind of makes the space around the eye smaller. And that would be like if you were squinting your eyes to see in the distance, you would be using orbicularis oculi. And that's also cranial nerve seven. So that's why I skipped down to that one. Corrugator supercilii and orbicularis oculi are both cranial nerve seven. Okay, but the one that's different here is the levator palpebrae superioris. This is cranial nerve three. So this is the um, muscle that elevates the upper eyelid. So let's see if we can find it here. Levator palpebrae superioris. Uh, no, we have labii. Levator palpebrae. No, it's not labeled here, but it would be this this muscle right in here, the muscle right on the upper eyelid. And what's, what's important about that is to realize that it is innervated by a different cranial nerve. And this becomes really important for a patient like Sarah that we were talking about at the beginning of this lecture, where Sarah is unable to move the muscles on the left side of her face. She can't move any of them. And she can't close her eye, if you remember, because closing of the eye requires uh, muscles like orbicularis oculi, and that's cranial nerve 7. So it, it would appear that cranial nerve 7 is not working properly. 
And the, the way that we know it's cranial nerve seven and not something farther back in the brain is because she is able to open her eyes wider. And that requires levator palpebrae superioris. And levator palpebrae superioris is innervated by a different cranial nerve. It's innervated by cranial nerve three. So when you do your exam on Sarah and she cannot move her face at all, except she is able to open her eyes wider, that tells you that the problem is with cranial nerve seven and that cranial nerve three is working just fine. And that actually leads you to the diagnosis. Um, oh, here, so the diagnosis is going to be something we call Bell's palsy. And it's unclear at this point really what causes Bell's palsy. We have some idea that there may be a virus involved and so sometimes we will give an antiviral medicine um, but most of the time you just kind of have to wait uh, and it will fix itself <clears throat> excuse me thankfully most patients are better after several weeks but for some it may take several months and for about five percent of patients they never really get their full function back but it's not a stroke it's not actually a problem with the brain at all it's a problem with one of the nerves, uh, cranial nerve seven. So those were talking about um, kind of muscles that were outside, external eye muscles, but there are actually muscles that attach to the eyeball itself. And of course, I mean, I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but obviously that's, that's necessary because you, you have to be able to move your eye pretty much in every direction. And so you need a muscle that can pull the eye up and pull the eye from side to side and pull the eye downward and muscles that can kind of rotate the eye in and out. And so you have six muscles that you can see here on the right. Um, and you've got um, four of them are called rectus muscles. Rectus just means um, kind of fibers all going in the same direction and either going in the longitudinal axis, such as superior and inferior rectus, um, or going in the horizontal axis, such as medial and lateral rectus muscles. Okay, so that's four of the six. The other two are called oblique muscles, and we'll see them on the next, um, the next slide. So there's a couple of things to think about. One is what direction would the eye move if each of these muscles were contracted. So for example, if you look at inferior rectus, that's this one down here. If you contract that, if you shorten that, it's gonna pull the eye downward. It's gonna help you look down. So that makes a lot of sense to me. The name of the muscle is inferior rectus. It's on the inferior part of the eyeball. And when it contracts, it moves the eyeball inferiorly. So all of that makes good sense. Uh, same thing with superior rectus. When it contracts, it's going to pull the eye upward or kind of move the eye up. So it's going to help you look up, help you look superior. And it's on the superior part of the eyeball. So that name all makes sense. Lateral rectus, as you can imagine, is going to, when it contracts, it's going to pull the eye laterally. And medial rectus, when it contracts, it's going to pull the eyeball or, or kind of rotate the eyeball medially. So I think those four muscles are pretty easy to remember, both what their function is and where they're located. Um, and they are all innervated by cranial nerve three, except for lateral rectus. It's innervated by cranial nerve number six, which is also called the abducens nerve. And make sure you know which of these muscles is not innervated by, I mean, cranial nerve three. I mean, this is like a, a multiple choice question just waiting to happen, right? It's got four muscles and one of them is not like the others. So that's a, a very easy multiple choice question to make. So make sure you, um, you remember that. Okay, so those are the four rectus muscles, but there are also two obliques. You can see here, there's an inferior oblique and there's a superior oblique. And we'll talk about it here on the next slide. So uh, let's look at inferior oblique first because it's also innervated by cranial nerve three, just like three of the four rectus muscles were. And I think you can see it a bit easier here. It 
uh, attaches to the eyeball kind of just behind and in, so posterior and inferior to lateral rectus. So when it contracts, it pulls the eye, it kind of, it rotates the eye. It's what we call extorting. It kind of rotates the eye in a, um, in a counterclockwise uh, rotation. So it does help move the, um, the eye up and out, as you can see here, but it also rotates the eyeball laterally or extorts, extorts the eyeball. Uh, so when we say um, up and out, what we mean is it helps you. It helps the eye kind of look um, up and out. So it would be kind of in this direction. If that contracts, it's going to help the eye move in that direction. And it's because that muscle runs oblique. It actually pulls posteriorly on the eye and kind of pulls that posterior part forward. And when it does that, it causes, and because it's slightly inferior, when it does that, it pulls the eye in an up and outward position. So superior oblique is gonna be the opposite. Its fibers are running this way, and it's gonna pull the eye, when it pulls the eye, down and out. So superior oblique goes down and out, and inferior oblique goes up and out. And when we get together in lab, there's some nice models there that we can look at together and, I, and if this is a little bit confusing to you on the video uh, we can look at those models together and, and I can try to explain it to you with the model in hand um, to see how the eyeball would move when those muscles contract. Okay notice also superior oblique is not innervated by cranial nerve 3 like the rest of the eye muscles. It is innervated by its own cranial nerve called cranial nerve 4. So here's something that we remember. I don't know if this is helpful to you, but this is how I remember which of the two, which two out of the six um, extraocular muscles are innervated by something other than cranial nerve three. So I know that four of them are innervated by cranial nerve three, and I know that two of them are not. So to keep straight which two are not, and to remember which cranial nerves innervate those muscles, we learn a chemical formula uh, of a sort. We call it LR6SO4. So SO4 looks like sulfate, for those of you uh, who remember your chemistry. And so this is why it kind of looks like a chemical formula to us, like H2O, right? So this is LR6SO4. And what that tells me is that lateral rectus is innervated by the sixth cranial nerve and superior oblique is innervated by the fourth cranial nerve. So that's how I remember um, those two special muscles, LR6, SO4, and you know maybe that's helpful for you as well. Okay, here's just some other views of it so that you can kind of see um, where those muscles insert. So we were talking about um, inferior oblique, for example, that it inserts posterior on the eyeball, which is why when it contracts and kind of pulls that back part of the eyeball forward, it makes the eye go up and out. Um, superior oblique, you'll notice, is a very interesting muscle because it's really like a pulley. If you remember, we were talking about um, in the, the bone chapter, the end of the bone chapter on at the appendicular skeleton, we were talking about how uh, bones can act as pulleys. Well, there's a pulley right here in the eye called the trochlea. It's kind of like a hook that comes off of the bony orbit and causes the superior oblique muscle to change direction um, so that it, it kind of hooks around that trochlea like a pulley and it changes direction just like the patella does and just like the, um, the malleolus of the ankle does, if you remember. Um, and so that's gonna affect how contraction of that muscle moves the eye. And again, when we get to lab together, we'll take a look at the models and I think it'll make a little bit more sense. If you've got a 3D program, it might also be helpful to kind of rotate the eye around and see how, um, where these muscles insert and how that would affect the movement. I just wanted to point out here as well that levator palpebrae superioris that we looked at is also runs kind of behind the eye. Huh. Did not mean to do that. <laughs> Let's see if I can 
go back. There we go. Um, what I was trying to show you is that levator palpebrae superioris comes into that upper eyelid, remember? And then goes all the way back. Oh, it made me lose my blue color for some reason. Huh. Well, let's try green. Um, so you can see how uh, levator palpebrae superioris kind of starts in that eyelid, but it comes all the way behind the eye and inserts back here. So that's also uh, partly kind of extraocular and also uh, kind of behind the eye. And this would be an anterior view of the muscles just to kind of see where they go. And if you kind of took the eyeball out and looked behind, you could see where all of the muscles attach. So you can see that inferior oblique is gonna attach way down here, kind of on the nasal side. This is where your nose would be, um, kind of inferior on the nasal side. So it's gonna pull the eye, the back of the eye in that direction, which eventually kind of twists the eye up and out. You can see uh, the rectus muscles very easily and how they all kind of insert here, um, right in the center, right around where the optic nerve exits the eye and enters um, the, the cranium. You can see superior rectus and behind it, you can see levator palpebrae superioris. And then you can see superior oblique with the trochlea kind of in the nasal superior side. And when we look at some sheep eyeballs together, um, you're gonna actually be able to see these muscles and where they insert. And maybe that'll also be helpful to you. All right, so we're still talking about um, muscles of facial expression, where we're, I should say we're coming back to muscles of facial expression, but we're gonna kind of stay a little bit more in the upper half of the face. I think occipital frontalis is another one of those muscles that's really easy to identify. It's huge and it's, it covers the whole forehead. So occipital frontalis, occipital means the back part of the head, right? And frontalis means the forehead. So that means this muscle goes all the way from the back of the head all the way to the front. In fact, it has what we call two muscle bellies. It has the frontal belly here. And then if we could turn this head around and look on the back, there would be a, uh, an occipital belly on the back side. And they're kind of attached by this aponeurosis um, here that you can see. So huge muscle. And when it contracts, it raises uh, both eyebrows up and kind of wrinkles the forehead. And I think of it as like the surprise face. So when you get kind of shocked and you go, <gasps> and your eyebrows kind of move up and your forehead wrinkles, that's using occipital frontalis. That's the surprise muscle. Temporal parietalis is a muscle that I have not developed and probably most of you have not developed either. Um, it's this muscle that's um, kind of flapped up here. And it's a muscle that can kind of move your ears if you developed it. So my wife and my daughter, for example, can wiggle their ears. I cannot. Nasalis is the um, muscle that kind of overlies the nose. And what it helps you do is to flare your nose. And you probably don't ever realize this, but if, you are, if you're ever exercising hard and you're really uh, breathing hard and trying to get air, uh, your body will flare your nostrils to make them larger so that more air can enter through your nose. The babies do this a lot when they start to have trouble breathing. You'll be able to see their noses flaring. It's much easier to see in children. So that nasalis muscle is really helpful for getting more air in when you're having trouble. Uh, and the last muscle on this slide is platysma. Platysma is this broad, flat muscle, and you have one on both sides. It kind of It's very superficial. In fact, if you just kind of took the skin away off of your neck, the very first muscle you would see is platysma, and it would actually cover the whole neck. They've cut it away here on the left side so that you can see the deeper muscles, but it's a very broad, thin muscle. And when it contracts, it kind of tenses the skin on the neck and lowers the jaw. And I kind of think of it as like the, the Hulk growling, going Rrr, and as he growls, you know, his neck kind of tenses up and 
Um, and he's using that platysma muscle to do that. Okay, mastication is the word for chewing. So we have some muscles that help in mastication. Uh, the, the main ones that we'll talk about we're showing here. Uh, temporalis is the muscle uh, right over the temporal bone. That's how you can know where it is, and it's kind of in the name. So that's this big muscle here. Uh, the strongest of the chewing muscles, however, is the masseter muscle, which we saw in a previous picture but didn't really talk about. It's a little bit, it's kind of an intermediate muscle. Uh, the rhizorus runs over the top of it. The rhizorus is kind of a thin horizontal muscle like we talked about. And just under that, you'll find masseter. And under masseter, you'll find buccinator, for example. So it's kind of an intermediate muscle. But it's really, it's the strongest of the chewing muscles. It's the one that does the bulk of the work. So it's, it's gonna close the jaw. It's gonna be the muscle that when it contracts, it's gonna bring that lower jaw up so that your teeth can come together and you can chew. Temporalis is gonna do the same thing, but it's gonna kinda pull the jaw a little bit backwards, what we would call retracting of the jaw. Because of the angle of those fibers, you can see that when they contract, they're gonna move the jaw not just up, up, yes, but also up and back or retracting. There are also pterygoids. The P is silent there. The pterygoid muscles attach uh, to part of the sphenoid bone and part of the maxilla, and they uh, help to open the jaw, so they work kind of opposite from uh, the muscles that we just talked about. And they don't need to be quite as strong as the ones that close the jaw because the closing of the jaw is what's actually mashing the food together. Um, so you have medial pterygoid and lateral pterygoid, and you can see them here on the picture. The lateral pterygoids um, are actually kind of moving the jaw backward to help with opening. Um, and then it's gonna help pull the jaw from side to side as well. Medial pterygoid is more like the other muscles that we've talked about, um, and it's gonna help to close the jaw as well. These are deep muscles, these are deep to the masseter muscle, so you would have to remove the masseter muscle to see these muscles. There are several tongue muscles, um, and they all have the term glossus in them. That's how you know that they are, that at least one end attaches to the tongue from that uh, root word glossus. And then you can kind of look at the other term to tell you where is the other end of that muscle attaching. So each of these attach to a part of the tongue, but they also attach to another area. So genioglossal, if you remember our root words, genio, uh, excuse me, <coughs> uh, genio refers more to the chin area. And so that's gonna tell you that it, it attaches at the chin and then up to the tongue. So that's going to depress and protract the tongue, pull the tongue down and kind of pull it forward. Um, so as it contracts, so if this is, the, if the tongue is up here, right, and if this contracts, it's gonna move the tongue in that direction. So it's gonna move it forward and it's gonna move it down, right? Hypoglossal just means below, right? Hypo means below. So below the tongue is hypoglossal or hypoglossus. Um, so you can see that is right here. So that's obviously gonna pull the tongue downward. <clears throat> we call it depressing the tongue. And because it's kind of in the back of the tongue, it also slightly protracts the tongue backwards. Palatoglossus is going to um, go from the tongue up to the palate, you can see. So you can imagine when that contracts, it's gonna move the tongue in that direction. So it will elevate the tongue and it will um, also pull the uh, palate down, depresses the palate. And that's important for when we swallow to kind of get that bolus of food moving to the back of the throat. Styloglossus is gonna to attach to the tongue and then to the styloid process, which you guys learned, um, which was part of the temporal bone. And again, because it's, it's gonna do similar to palatoglossus uh, as far as elevating the tongue, 
um, and it will also pull that tongue back into the mouth. Back real quick, I didn't mention all the cranial nerves, but notice that uh, genoglossus and hyp hypoglossus are innervated by 12, uh, as is styloglossus, but palatoglossus is innervated by 10. So by checking movements of the tongue, for example, we can tell the patient to stick their tongue out, to lift their tongue up, to stick their tongue back inside, to move their tongue from side to side. And this will, this will evaluate largely cranial nerve 12 to make sure it's working right, and then to a lesser degree, cranial nerve 10. We often uh, evaluate a cranial nerve 10 by having them try to swallow. Uh, so, but by moving the tongue around, particularly by sticking it out and raising it, we're able to um, kind of check the function of cranial nerve 12. And this can be important if you think your patient has a stroke and you're trying to figure out where the stroke is or if the stroke Now this is important because if we go up, sorry, it's present. So here's another case, for example, uh, of Jose, and he's complaining of some slurring speech, some double vision, and he's having difficulty swallowing for the last three hours. So as part of his exam, as I was just mentioning, you ask him to stick his tongue straight out, and I do this I do this all the time with, with anybody that I think could have a head injury or a stroke. This is part of what I do is have them stick their tongue out. And this is what I'm looking for. So you tell Jose to stick his tongue out and he tries to, he tries to stick it straight out. But what happens is every time he does it, his tongue pulls to the right and you suspect that he might have a stroke. So the question I have here is which side of his brain do you think has the stroke? And we haven't talked about um, the um, uh, ner nervous system yet, but uh, what, one of the things we'll talk about is how the, the left side of your brain controls the right side of your body and the right side of your brain controls the left side of your body. So if his tongue is pulling to the right, as it is in this picture, you see how the tongue is kind of moving in that direction. That means that the muscles on this side are working, right? They're contracting and they're pulling. But the muscles on this side are not working. And so you have kind of unequal pulling and that pulls the tongue off to the right. Normally you would get pulling from both sides and that would cause the tongue to stay straight. But because the left side is not working, the, the tongue pulls to the right. So that means the right is working and the left is not. So if the left is not working, that means the right side of the brain is not working. So he probably has a stroke uh, somewhere on the right side of his brain near where cranial nerve 10 comes out of the brain. Okay, here are some other um, muscles. I'm just gonna mention them for the sake of completeness, but you don't have to memorize any of these. There are muscles that raise the pelvis. There are several muscles that are involved with swallowing. Um, and you can see them here uh, listed. I just want you to be aware of how many other muscles there were in kind of the inside of the neck that are, um, that are used largely for swallowing. There's a bunch of them, but I won't make you learn their names. Okay, we can also find several muscles underneath the neck. Uh, these would be muscles that are deep to that platysma muscle that we talked about before. And I'm really only going to have you um, learn three of these, and they're the ones that are kind of bolded. So digastric helps you open your mouth. Um, and it's di means two, right? And gastric means belly. So it's basically two bellies. And you can see there is a anterior belly here. And then there's like a pulley there again, and you have the posterior belly going in that direction. So when that contracts, it's gonna pull the chin down and open the mouth. Uh, then we have the omohyoid, and it is another one of these two belly guys. You can see here, there's the two bellies, the superior and the inferior belly. And that's going to, um, let's move that over just a little bit so you can read that. That's gonna depress the hyoid bone. Remember the hyoid bone is that kind of U-shaped 
um, floating bone just between the chin and the Adam's apple, um, which the Adam's apple is called the cricoid um, cartilage. Oh, they're not showing it there. Um, or the thyroid cartilage of the larynx. There we go. So it sits in between those two, and it helps with swallowing. It helps with breathing. Uh, it helps with speech a little bit. Um, so that omohyoid muscle is important for those functions, speech and swallowing in particular. Okay, then another muscle that you definitely have to learn. Um, it's one of the muscles that's visible in the neck um, from the surface. Um, even through the skin, you can tell where this one is. And it is called the sternocleidomastoid. And I always think of it as three sternocleidomastoid muscle. Uh, and it's just telling you, the reason it has three names in it is it's telling you where that muscle begins and where it ends, where it inserts um, and where it originates. So sternum, you got sterno, so you know it's going to end up on the sternum. So you can see this belly ends up on the sternum. Clido means clavicle, so it's going to also attach to the clavicle. So that belly attaches to the clavicle. And it begins, it originates here back on the that temporal bone near the mastoid process. And so it's quite a large muscle that kind of begins as one belly but then splits into two. The sternocleidoid, sorry, sternocleidomastoid muscle. When it contracts, it kind of flexes the neck laterally. Or another way to think about it is it tries to make your ear touch your shoulder. When you make that movement, that's the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Okay, we're going to talk about some back muscles, but I'm not going to make you learn uh, really too many of these back muscles. Now, we'll talk about uh, some of the, the superficial ones that you have to know um, when we get to the appendicular skeleton, the ones that move the scapula. Uh, but here we're talking about kind of the deep back muscles that surround the, spine, the, uh, the vertebral column and help that vertebral column be stable, uh, help it maybe flex, help it maybe extend. Um, and there's several of them there, and I'm not gonna, we're not going to really go through them. We will go through these extrinsic ones when we do the appendicular muscles. Uh, for now, we're just going to mention, just like we did with the, the muscles of uh, the, the, around the esophagus, the swallowing muscles, uh, just that there are a bunch, um, but I'm not going to make you learn the names. Same thing here, tons of muscles surrounding the vertebral column, uh, necessary for flexion, rotation, uh, extension of the back and um, the vertebral column, but you don't have to learn them by name. Okay, there are also some um, cervical, thoracic, and abdominal wall muscles. These are also part of the axial skeleton. Uh, I'm not going to make you learn a bunch of them. I do want you to learn the scalenes, um, which you can, we, we use the word um, scalene in plural because there are actually several scalene muscles. You can see posterior, middle, uh, and anterior. And these muscles are important for breathing. Uh, they pull up on ribs one and two in order to help expand the, the thoracic cavity to help you take in a bigger breath. So they're really important for, um, for breathing when you need extra air. They will also, however, flex the neck. So if they, if they, if they all contract at the same time, that will pull the neck straight down as long as they are contracting together on both sides. If, however, only one side contracts, that's how you turn your head to one side. When those scalene muscles um, contract, they kind of spin the head around to one side. So when they contract together, they flex, but when they contract only on one side, they turn the head towards that side. There are some other muscles uh, in the thoracic cavity as well that are helpful with breathing um, that I'm going to have you learn here. We call them intercostals. That means they are the muscles that are in between the ribs, and we'll actually see a picture of them, a better picture on the next slide of the intercostal muscles. Um, but if you can remember that the external um, intercostals elevate the ribs, so you have E for external and E for elevate, 
So elevating the ribs, pulling the ribs up, that makes the thoracic cavity bigger. That helps you to take a breath in to inhale, or what we call inspiration is the same as inhalation. Uh, so that's the external intercostals. The internal intercostals are just the opposite. They're going to depress the ribs, and they're going to lead to expiration or exhalation. Okay, but on this picture, what you can see are serratus anterior and posterior. Serratus are kind of like those muscles I think of. Um, they do help with breathing, but I always think of them like as the boxer muscles. They're, they're the muscles that get really big on the lateral chest and people that are doing a lot of um, um, kind of shoulder retraction and, and movement like punching, um, like Rocky and all those guys from those those old uh, boxing movies, they all have really defined uh, serratus muscles. So you can see serratus anterior on this picture. It's kind of like this group of uh, muscles there. So the intercostal muscles, this is what we were talking about. There are some that are external. Let's see if we can move this picture over. There are some that are external. They're gonna be more on the outside and they run in that direction. And then the internal ones are kind of just underneath and behind the ribs and they run in the opposite direction so that when they contract, they do the opposite. Uh, when these contract, um, they kind of pull the ribs upward and when these contract, they kind of pull the ribs downward. Okay, we also have several abdominal muscles. I think the one that's easiest to remember uh, is rectus abdominis. That's the one here that kind of gives you your six pack if you're working on that. Or if you're someone like me, you don't have a six pack, you just have one big keg uh, in the front of your abdomen. Um, but a lot of you guys are working on your six packs or your eight packs. And that's really the rectus abdominis muscle. That's the one that you do your crunches with. Uh, and it compresses the abdomen, uh, which actually helps with exhalation sometimes. Um, and also flexes the vertebral column so that you can uh, bend forward a little bit. Uh, if we go back up to the top, you have two oblique muscles. Oblique just means, you know, they run in this direction. Um, and so you've got external obliques uh, that you can kind of see running here. And then you have internal obliques, uh, which you can kind of see um, running in there. So they're just, the external obviously is more superficial, internal is going to be um, deeper uh, than the external. Uh, and they flex and rotate the vertebral column is kind of their main job, but they also are part of the, the abdominal wall that kind of keeps your organs inside the abdomen. So um, they're also there for support. And then the transversus abdominis is another oblique muscle that helps to compress the muscle. You can't see it well on this picture. Um, it's, kind of, it's kind of behind, it's very deep to the rest of those muscles, so there's no way to see it here. Uh, I wonder if we have another picture. Not really. Um, there's a good, on the model that we have, uh, some of the models that we have in the lab, you can see it well. Okay, a very important muscle in the, in the chest and abdomen area is the diaphragm. That's this large muscle that actually separates the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity and is really the primary muscle for breathing. Uh, we've been talking about other muscles that aid in breathing, but really the number one primary muscle for breathing is the diaphragm. So when the diaphragm contracts, uh, it actually expands the thoracic cavity. When it contracts, it moves downward towards the abdomen, and that makes the thoracic cavity larger, uh, and that allows for us to breathe in, or that allows for inspiration to occur. When the diaphragm relaxes, it comes, it moves back up into the chest cavity and forces air out or exhalation, expiration with relaxation. And very important to remember that the phrenic nerves, uh, which come out of the cervical spine, innervate um, the, uh, the diaphragm. And so if you damage the phrenic nerve, uh, you'll paralyze the diaphragm. And if you paralyze the diaphragm, you die from suffocation because you're not able to breathe. Um, there is another unique feature here to the diaphragm. It's called the central tendon. You can see it runs right along the middle part of that diaphragm and it kind of holds all those muscle fibers together. There are also some holes in the diaphragm in order to allow uh, some uh, organs and blood vessels to pass through. 
So there's an opening, for example, for the, the vena cava, there's an opening for the aorta, there's an opening for the esophagus, um, in order to allow those blood vessels and organs to pass through from the chest to the abdomen. This is kind of what um, it looks like in gross section. Uh, you can see this is where the heart would be, but they've taken it out so that we can see. You can see the aorta here, uh, the esophagus here, and, and all of this here, this is all this is all diaphragm. And you can see how it separates the, the thorax from the abdomen. Oh, and there's the inferior vena cava moving through. Okay, last thing we'll talk about are perineal muscles or pelvic floor muscles. Uh, and we do have one model uh, that's really good in the lab uh, that will help you see these a little bit better. But when we talk about the pelvis and we talk about the muscles and the structures in the pelvis, uh, we talk about the idea of triangles in the pelvis. And so there are two primary triangles, uh, the anterior triangle and the posterior triangle. And they're really um, kind of delineated by the, the ischial spines. So the anterior triangle is this one here. And then the posterior triangle is kind of the smaller one that goes back to the sacrum. So in the anterior triangle, you actually have two more triangles. Uh, the urogenital triangle, that's the area um, uh, that surrounds the, the urethra and the vagina in a woman or the area around the penis in a man. And then that's innervated by the pudendal nerve. The posterior triangle, sometimes we also call the anal triangle, um, that is also mostly uh, innervated by the pudendal nerve, um, but there is, are some other nerves involved. I would just remember that one nerve, the pudendal nerve, that it really innervates a lot of these muscles uh, in the pelvis, in the pelvic floor. So there are superficial muscles and then there are deeper muscles. So we're gonna look at each of the um, triangles, the two triangles that we talked about, and we're gonna look at superficial muscles, and then we're gonna go deeper and look at some of the deeper muscles. So if we stick to the urogenital triangle, which is the anterior triangle, so that's, that's this one here. We're gonna look at some of the superficial muscles there. Uh, probably one of the most important ones is um, bulbospongiosis. Um, and so that's a muscle, let's kind of zoom in there a little bit. Um, bulbospongiosis is this one here that kind of surrounds on a female, the vaginal opening. Uh, on a man, you can see it kind of surrounds the base of the penis here. And so it's important for maintaining an erection. Um, it also aids in ejecting urine and sperm when it contracts. Um, and for women, it narrows the vaginal opening. Uh, another muscle that's important, especially in men, for maintaining an erection would be the ischiocavernosis, which is just kind of right alongside uh, the bulbospongiosis that we talked about. And then there's a superficial transverse perineal muscle. Let's see here. And it's easy to identify because it's the one that pretty much goes straight across, hence the name transverse. Then there are some deep muscles, and that's how you should try to remember them, which ones are superficial, which ones are deep and which triangle, anterior or posterior. So we're still talking about anterior triangle, but now we're gonna to go to deep muscles. And a lot of these are more for support of the pelvis to kind of hold pelvic organs like the bladder, uh, the rectum in a woman, the uterus and ovaries and things like that to keep them from falling out of the bottom. Um, these muscles are important. So just like there was a superficial transverse perineal muscle, there's also a deep transverse perineal muscle. And this one's pretty easy to identify because it runs horizontal, but it's a very broad muscle. And then the one that's really important here would be the external urethral sphincter. And I'm sorry, I <laughs> just colored over it, but it's right in that area. It's the muscle, it's a circular muscle, a sphincter muscle that surrounds the, the uh, urethra uh, so that it's able to help you hold your urine. So for example, when you're a child, you don't have control over that. You haven't learned 
voluntary control over your external urethral sphincter. But that's what you learn during potty training. You learn how to control that muscle, how to keep it contracted until you're ready to go to the bathroom. And when you're ready to go, you go, you relax that muscle, and as you relax it, the urine is able to flow out. So that is that is necessary to have control over urination. You have to have proper function of that muscle. Okay, let's move to the posterior triangle, or what's called the anal triangle, and we'll look at some of the muscles there. Uh, coccygeus muscle, if we blow it up a little bit, you can see coccygeus here kind of runs posteriorly, and it's a little bit more superficial. And that's really just used for support of the pelvic floor uh, to kind of hold everything in. Levator ani is also used for support of the pelvic floor. Um, if we can find it here. There are actually two muscles, even more, that make up the levator ani, but we're going to group them together as one group of muscles. So we're going to say that all of this on both sides is levator ani, and that just kind of keeps everything inside. And then just like you had an external urethral sphincter up here, you have an external anal sphincter there. And same idea, you have to learn how to control that so that you can uh, hold your stool until you're ready to go to the bathroom. Uh, when you're a, an infant, you don't know how to control that muscle, so you just go in your diaper. That's why we put diapers on you. But as you get potty trained, you learn how to control that muscle um, and, and only go to the bathroom when it's appropriate. So that external anal sphincter is necessary for voluntary control of defecation. Okay, we have a good model of the pelvic muscles, and so we'll take a look at that together in class. Make sure you bring any questions with you to lab. I'll be happy to go through them with you with the models, and I think some of this will make even better sense then.